Hey everyone, let's wrap up April. Before we get into the video, let's address the fact that this will be very, very low key edited. I'm using no extra mic, so I'm hoping that the camera will work out and there's not too much clicking noise, which the camera likes to make. And aside from putting up the pictures of all the audiobooks and ebooks I read, there will be no book information on this side. And let me know if that is something you actually like or enjoy because I like doing them. Because you know me, I'm always struggling remembering the names of people and so I don't mention them and just put them up here, like the authors, the translators and the narrators. I also like the little extra tidbits of information of how long the book was and in what format I read them, just as extras. But I am struggling currently to make them and I need to find easier ways of editing. But currently I am just low, low, low energy. This week was horrible. I mainly want to lie down and do nothing. I force myself to do things because I know lying down and doing nothing is going down the wrong road. So that's why we're here filming this and trying to get it up today so that it's out there for you to see and for me to have done and feel accomplished about. That's very selfish of me. But anyways, let's get into what happened in April. In April, I uploaded two videos. One was a goals check-in. So we talked about my first quarter, how it went and what I'm hoping to do for Q2. And April already was awful. Didn't do good there, so. Moving on, but thank you all for sharing your gold status with me and watching the video, just as well as enduring my horrible reading travel vlog. So I traveled and it was a lot of stress and it is a lot about me dealing with the stress of traveling again and the audiobooks I listened to. But now let's get into the books. And I already a little bit spoiled it. I read a lot of audiobooks, but let's get to the one physical book I read. The House of Doors is not a big book. It's very enjoyable, but it took me forever to read. I don't know why. It's very slow paced. When I picked it up, I enjoyed it. But when I put it down, I forgot about it easily. And I was struggling with finding time during the day to read and sit down and read. So, but what is it about? I am a little bit confused still, but it's mostly historical fiction and it's told from two perspectives. In alternating chapters, we get Leslie chapters and Willie chapters in different spaces of time. So some are set in the 1940s, some in the 1920s, and some in 1910. And they span the story of different things happening. Most of it is set in 1920 when the author, I forgot the name, we call them Willie all the time, visits this couple in Penang, and Leslie is the wife. The author is friends with the husband, I think Robert. Names are not my strongest suit today or anytime lately or soon. Anyways, so Willie and Leslie have a lot of conversations and we're mainly getting their perspectives of the story. We get them in the 1920s going through the day and the events that happen when Willie visits his friend and brings along his secretary slash boyfriend. And we get to know a lot about the events there and Willie and Leslie get talking. And at some point, Leslie tells him the story of what happened back in 1910. And there is also a murder mystery involved. There's a revolution or a revolutionary, a Chinese one who lived at that time in Penang as well to collect money or raise money for the revolution in China and all of that. I must say I learned facts that I didn't know. I read afterwards that the murder trial happened and that is real. And it's been published in one of the author's books. And so there is a lot of connection to what's happened. So historical facts, but there's also some talk around that wasn't real and that's been invented, of course. And you know me with historical fiction, I'm always a little bit confused. I did like the parts here because I have no clue of what happened back then. So there's no confusing me with what's real and what's not. I'm just taking everything for granted, which is probably the wrong way to go at it. But still, I 
really enjoyed reading about the time, about the events that happened, about the characters. But like I said, it was a lot slower than I expected and I just kept forgetting that it existed. But if you're interested, I can recommend it for that. That was probably the worst summary of that book ever. But let's move on. Like I said, I listened to a lot of audiobooks and there was a lot of nighttime reading. If you don't know, I'm currently reading physical books or trying to read physical books during the day and stick to ebooks at night because when I fall asleep on them, which I do a lot, unfortunately I don't sleep through, I just wake up a lot as well, so I keep falling asleep a lot, and it's easier to fall asleep on a Kindle. So I read series actually mostly, and that's four books in the Tenserit series. I started the series ages ago with the first book and then picked it up in April, read book two, three, four, and then went back to book one because I realized I don't really remember what happened there. And while reading the first book, I noticed I remembered the first part, but none of the rest. So that was interesting. I really enjoyed the series. It's a series set in a fictional Asian town with a protector as the ruler. Unfortunately, it's not like a protector should be. It's more a cruel dictator and their children. We're following mostly two of her children, twins, which were mostly born just to pay a debt to a monastery when she enlisted them for help. And so that's the payment. These two twins, go through events, the whole books go through events, mostly focused, the first two are on the twins and their narrations and their adventures, let's say it like that, from birth to later on in life, I think 40s, 50s. The third book follows a murder investigation or rather an investigation into something that happened. And the last book is a story where we see the one-sided conversation. So as you can tell, it's already fun how these books are told. The first two books, like I said, center around the twins mostly and the events around the protectorate and what happens with them. I found myself getting very engrossed and invested in the characters. I remembered from reading the first book again that I had trouble understanding the world building and I think it's a little bit to the word because there is some magic, let's call it magic, there people can use different forms of the environment like earth and forest and water and stuff like that and they can tense it and these people are called tensors and that's why the series is called the tensorate and the tensors of course have more power than the other people and so they can oppress them and they are the ruling class. The protector as well. And the revolutions or the rebellions that are constantly plaguing the country are people that are people that want to be free of this oppression. And there's a counter movement called the Machinists who use machines instead of people to work plows and stuff like that. Basic world building. <laughs> so, and in the first time I read that, I didn't completely understand that. And I had trouble understanding it with the word, the tensing, when people tense things. In my brain, it always went like this. And I don't know, that's probably a me problem with reading second language and everything like that. But rereading the first book, it made lots more sense. And also the series made a lot more sense. I enjoyed that book three and four had a different focus and a different style of writing. So they're all novellas, but three and four are even shorter than the first two. And they're the most interesting part, aside from the story and the characters, with the writing. With the third book following an investigation, we got investigation reports, we got diary entries, we got interviews and all these things. And we found ourselves always in the shoes of the investigator who didn't know everything. So that was Sometimes frustrating where you were like, I want to know the facts. I want to know everything, but you couldn't. And the fourth book is a one-sided conversation after an event that happens, recalling something in the past. So we have one person telling the story to someone else. And sometimes we can see or notice that the narrator is reacting to interjections from the other person, but we never hear the other person. We don't know who they are. and what questions or what parts they put um, add to the conversation. And that's also a very interesting way of telling a story. So that I enjoyed very much and I can highly recommend the series. Take some time with it and 
be open for the world building that takes a little bit more to be fully comprehended as far as I'm concerned. And that's when we move to the audiobooks now. The rest of the books were all listened to, a lot of them on my vacation because I was on the train a lot and I was walking out a lot. So I listened to another series or rather the first two books in the series of the Constance Verity Saves the World or something book series. It's fantasy, urban fantasy. They were fun, they were entertaining. I enjoyed the first book a lot more where we met Constance Verity in her 30s, tired of always having adventures. We learned that when she was very, very young, or rather when she was born, fairy godmother came and said, didn't you get to live dangerously and adventurously? And now everything keeps finding her and she has to protect the world and save the world a lot. But then she's like in her 30s and thinks she would like to have a normal life more. So she's going out looking for her godmother and wants to kill her because she thinks that solves the problem. Of course, that's not how it goes. The second book I found a lot less interesting as it was a lot less focused on adventures. They were sort of in the backdrop, but more on the relationships the characters had. And even though that was interesting, I was more in an adventure mood and not dealing with issues when you have a partner and a different life or a difficult life, things like that. The rest of the books were standalones and let's move to The Circus Infinite, a book I loved. This was a very surprise read. I've had it in my wish list for a while and I kept forgetting why I put it there. And then one day I just got it and started it and I was immediately in love. So The Circus Infinite follows a bunch of characters and a lot of species and a lot of worlds and I forgot all of that. It's introduced in the beginning, but you have a name and a species and descriptions of how they look and I was lost. That's a me thing, not the book's fault. They did it very well in the book, but I was just confused, but I could keep the characters apart. So it wasn't that you get confused. It's just like all the names of the species and the planets they were coming from and the culture they have were a little bit lost on me on audio, but that's not because it was done badly, but because it was a lot of info dump in the beginning that I forgot or couldn't keep up with on audio. The main character is a young man who's running away from a, let's say an experimental prison where people experimented on him because he has special powers and they wanted to see how they can use that and maybe read it or whatever do with that. It becomes more clear throughout the books. So we don't get um, him in the beginning in the Institute and then after he ran away, but we get him running away and then there are flashbacks to the Institute with experiments and the people there and the things going on. So we start right in the middle of the story and we see him looking for a job on one of those pleasure moons where he hopes to get blend in and not be found. And so there he joins a crew at a circus and then the story takes rolling. We get to learn about the interactions between the different characters. We get to learn about the world and their political, let's say Capone style power dynamics and things going on. I was really invested in the story for the characters. I was invested in the family dynamics and friendships that were going on. I was also really invested in seeing how the asexuality of our main character was incorporated and addressed with the guy they liked and how that was always talked about. So I think that's probably the most integrated asexual representation in a relationship that I've read about that didn't feel like telling me how to do it. So like a guidebook. And I also enjoyed the subplot or the action plot that's around the Institute and the powers and also power dynamics of really being taken advantage of by someone else, mainly the ruling mobster of the town and being blackmailed into doing things you don't want to do. So there are some tough scenes. I think if you are prone to triggers, you might want to check the trigger warnings that are there, but I highly recommend it. I highly enjoyed it. If you're in any way interested in science fiction and found family dynamics and finding your way and your own identity and place in the world, I highly recommend this. It was very enjoyable. Let's move away from that to some more literary fiction. I listened to Small Worlds and 
I mostly think a lot of it went over my The story follows mostly a young man and him coming of age at the end of high school and moving to college and starting university and growing up and having relationships and how things work, family dynamics again between him and his brother, him and his father and his mother and also all of that set on the background of African immigrants to London and being black in London, the community and the treatments and all of that. I enjoyed the narration. I enjoyed how we focus on these small worlds. The book does carry quite a few repetitions to drive a point home. So, you know, small worlds is often mentioned as this is like the small world we live in. It's not the big picture. It's just a small community we have. It's a small situation in various situations. And I don't know if these small worlds are connected or parallels. That's the part I think I missed listening to it, but I really enjoyed listening to the narration. I really enjoyed spending time with the characters, seeing them grow and facing their challenges and all of that. I keep saying all of that. Days of Distraction is a completely different coming of age story. It's set in the United States, mostly following a mid twenties woman, Asian American, who is working at the moment as a journalist in tech reviews or things like that, trying to get a promotion, a, high, a raise or some more acceptance and praise at her workplace, but she's always held down, not being considered for more money and told to wait. There are changes in the company and that's the first part where we follow her. Then there's also her story with her boyfriend. They've been together for five years, I think, and he's a white American. He's about to start his PhD. And so he might need to move away from San Francisco to graduate school. And that's also affecting her in trying to figure out what do I want to do? Do I keep working here? Do I start another magazine or something? And it's, that tension is there. And then we shift when they move to a different place on the East Coast. And there the focus gets more and more with her researching into interracial relationships, into Chinese migration and the laws about interracial marriages in the migration in general. And we see that she's working a lot less there. It's a lot less the demographics of the East Coast city are completely different to what they were used in San Francisco. So she stands out a lot more and doesn't feel as comfortable and as home. So her gaze shifts a little bit on her awareness of herself and her relationship. And I really thought that was really interesting to follow, to see her struggle with that. Also the differences in the different towns and how she starts to look differently. I think that she in the past didn't even notice or recognize. There are a lot of conversations between her and her family, her and her friends. There's also some historical data. I really enjoyed that she interspersed the research that she did into Chinese immigration and the interracial marriage laws and things that she discovered that are given in the chapters in between. And I noticed once I finished listening to it that I would have liked to go back and just read the nonfiction parts of the story, but they were not separate chapters, so I couldn't find them on the audiobook. So that's a downside for the audiobook. But overall, I really liked listening to it and it was a really enjoyable story. And it doesn't have a proper final ending. Everything is up in roses or up in drama or whatever, but it just shows her that she progressed, that things moved forward, but we don't really have an ending or a conclusion to the problems that are going on, just like life. So I enjoyed that as well. Two more to go. I listened to a nonfiction, basically in one go, The Age of Magical Overthinking is enjoyable. It's not what I expected. It's a lot less about overthinking, but more about cognitive biases and some of the theory and then putting it in connection to the author in self-reflection where she sees herself being affected by these cognitive biases and also putting them into a social media and cultural connection of our times with current events and examples. I really enjoyed that. I think for someone who has heard 
or read about cognitive biases before, like I did, there are a few of the examples that she mentions and the research that she talks about that will sound familiar, but I still enjoyed having the repetition. It was not boring or too dry, and I also enjoyed putting it into use to herself and the situation we live in now. So very current. I think it will be outdated rather soon-ish. So maybe in four or five years, this will feel very outlived with all the examples that are given, but I could be wrong there. For now, very enjoyable. I could recommend it. And the audiobook was, like I said, very easy to listen to. I listened to it in one go. The last book is science fiction again, and I was actually anticipating this book from the cover alone. I saw the cover and heard that it was a mix between Firefly and Becky Chambers, and I was hooked. And then I had a lot of issues of how to get what kind of edition here in Germany. So I, at some point I needed to settle onto the audiobook because that was the easiest accessible version or format for me. And I liked it, but I do find that I want to have a physical copy once it's available here to reread it more slowly. The story is actually, as far as I hear it now, it's the first in a series which I didn't know. So when the book ended, it just ended in the middle of the story from my perspective. And I was confused because I didn't see before anywhere that it's a series. And I think I only saw it in one review that it's mentioned that it's a series. And I mean, it's obviously a series, hopefully, because it ends in the middle of the story. There's no conclusion to one part of the story. And there must be something more. Like, I, as you can tell, I'm excited about the book still. I'm not actually sure if I can sum up the story properly, but the story is a lot about the characters of a ship and Ocean Yun is our main character we're following and their place in this world, in this society and also on their ship and their friendships. And as the book progresses, we get a lot more people in and see their interactions. And it is a story of a group of misfits coming together and finding their place. There's also a love story angle. There's a crime angle. There is some super major rich family ruling everything. Some people are pissed off because what they did. So they tried to murder them and attack them and things in that political sphere, but at the moment I listened to it literally on the last day of April and the first day of May. I listened to it very fast because I was enjoying it, but I don't think I completely grasped all the details. Not because of the book, but because of me. I'm very, very unfocused lately, so I do like to have someone talking and telling me stories in the background, but I'm not completely able to take everything in. That's why I said I would love to reread the books before the second book comes out, whenever that is, and get reacquainted a little bit more with the world building because there is world building. It's not info dump in the beginning, but the information comes throughout the chapters and the story, which I like. And also the characters are introduced properly. They are introduced in a way that we learn more about them and not they are there and then they are flat, but they all have more depth and the depth keeps going. And also how they form together as a group and the interaction there. It's very interesting. I really enjoyed it. I'm not very clear on the story, but it's probably in the synopsis that I haven't read. Maybe it says there that it's a series and everybody knew it. Anyways, I highly enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to this second book and also to getting my hands on the physical copy. I did some more reading of short stories, but I haven't finished them. I have a collection of Chinese short stories, which are really short, short, which is perfect for me at night because some are just a page and I can't even get through a page before I fall asleep. I couldn't also say summaries of those stories because the book I think contains about a hundred and up to now, on the 5th of May, I have read about 40 of them. And the stories are a little bit a basis of a culture. 
So there's a lot of stories about ghosts and fox birds and a lot of stories of beautiful women luring men to have sex with them and then something bad happens to them. So they, are, they feel like the folklore and the mythological basis of a society and a culture and I'm enjoying them. Like I said, they are very, very short. It's not about the writing, it's more the oral stories that you've heard all about and then someone wrote them down. That's how it feels. Very good for when you can't sleep and you don't have to remember a full story, but you can read just the story on a page. And then if you fall asleep halfway through, you go back and read the whole thing again. Like I said, reading is a challenge right now and basically life is a challenge right now. So let's finish the wrap up here. Everything I read and did in April. Thank you all for sticking with me. Thank you for watching. If you're still here, let me know how your April reading went. Did you have good books? Have you heard of any of the books that I talked about? Or do you have any good recommendations for less focused, fast reads? Let me know in comments. Thank you for watching.